I'm, I'm, I'm happy that most of the people here are faculty. I'm, I'm aiming the talk not to the students, but I'm aiming the talk to the faculty. Uh, just some, some background. I, in, in, in my life, I have lectured and given workshops at more than 150 universities. They're all different. They're all different in the culture, the politics, the support, the role of different professions, but they have generally some things in common. Almost all universities are organized this way, and almost all important problems are organized this way. And many, many universities are now recognizing that this is very good for going deep into a subject, but that the, the, real, the really complicated problems don't always require depth. They require the linking of breadth. Now, the, the, school, the school where I spent almost all of my teaching life, I taught at Harvard for 48 years before I decided to teach teachers. Ten years ago, I decided I wanted to teach teachers, not students. And the, the reason is because in, 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 in Harvard, there is a long, long tradition that one student does one project. If you have a studio, it's a studio-oriented school. It's a project-oriented school. We give lectures, we have theory courses, but the real, the real heart of the school is the studio. And if you're a teacher in the studio, you might have 15 students. You give the problem, and each student gives a, a design. In my studio, for 45 years, I didn't. I never gave, I never in my life gave a client, a site, and a program. I made the students figure out the client, the site, and the program. And in my advanced studio, I made 15 students do one project. And every three weeks, a different group of students had to run the organization. And I wrote a paper 30 years ago on the difference, on the difference between edu educating conductors versus training soloists. And my school was famous for training soloists, but very few became conductors. And when they did become conductors, they ran offices. It was because of the mafia of Harvard, not because of their particular skill. And so I started to teach large projects of change where it was very clear to everybody that no one student, and certainly no one faculty member, knew enough. In other words, I'm the professor. But this project requires sociology, economics, ecology, hydrology, law, and I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a hydrologist. I know a little bit about all of these subjects, but not a lot about any of these subjects. And I think that, that this is very important. My, my talk today has two parts. In the, in the first part, I'm going to talk about an emerging, an emerging field of practice. It has a name, geodesign. It has a name, and, it, and it's, it's had about 15, 12 to 15 international conferences. One of them is eight years old, so it's about eight to 10 years old. Um, and it's focused, it's focused on the, the combination of many people working together in a digital environment computer supported environment to work on very large, very large, long-term, multi-system, multi-client, and most important, contentious. Contentious meaning people don't agree. And we're foolish to think that they will agree until they see what's going on. In other words, we, we have to figure out how to get them to agree at the end, not at the beginning. And one which should not become a zero-sum game. That's actually important. It, it, means, it means that 
for this kind of for this kind of circumstance, if if it's a zero sum game, it means your design won and everybody else lost. It's a competition. And a competition works for small projects, but it doesn't work for large projects. Because if you win, he may have a design that's in third place that has aspects that are better than your design. And you have no way, you have no way of compromising your design because it's seen as a compromise, rather than steal from him and make your design better. So the psychology, the psychology of education and the psychology of practice is totally different when it's not a zero-sum game. And we teach our students in a zero-sum game. They want to be here, but they don't want to recognize that down here there are many combinations of design that might be better than this design. And the bigger the project, the more that's true. Okay? So I'm going to talk about this in general, and then I'm going to show you two very large projects. All right? Very large projects. Really large projects. But they're real. They're real projects in the world. Okay? All right. By the way, don't take notes because he has the slides, and and this, the, there are there are about eight or ten lectures related to this work in, on YouTube, so it's very well done. Now, what geodesign does is it applies systems thinking to the creation of proposals for change and their impact simulations informed by their geography and usually, but not always, supported by digital technology. And what's happening in this, in this view of design is we, we need to change geography. We need to change the geography of the stuff, the place. The, the, at the scale that appears on a map. All right? Either to protect it or to develop it or in some combination. And the word design, it's in another paper that I wrote many years ago. I wrote a paper called Design is a Verb, Design is a Noun. And most people use the word design as a noun, an object. But to do something by design means to do something intentionally. You're, you're, you're doing it purposely by design. That's the meaning of the word in English. And I don't know if it's a Spanish equivalent. Geodesign is an invented word. It was invented by three people in the 1990s who published the word, but they did not know each other. They each invented the word for purposeful changing of geography. It's a very useful term to describe a collaborative activity. Collaborative meaning we have to design together. That is not the exclusive territory of any design profession, geographic science, or information technology. That's important. Argentina, I, I, have, I have views of the world that are not necessarily popular. But Argentina suffers because of the assumptions that architects can do anything. Okay? Which is crazy. You have an architect who does, can design a spoon, or the house where you do brain surgery, or the territorial landscape. I know nobody who can do that well. Nobody. So why do we believe this? It's a, it's a foolish belief represented in the professional structure. And, and the problem here is that, there, that each participant must know and be able to contribute something that the others cannot or do not know. Yet during the process, no one need lose his or her professional, scientific, or personal history. In other words, what what those of us who are doing this, are, what I think we want, is not to create a new profession, not to do that, but to find ways that existing professions can work together without the assumption that one knows more than the other. With the assumption that they know different things, not all things. Now, this is, this is the way I see the world, and, and it's complicated. And I see it mainly from 
the perspective of North America and Europe, mainly, because that's my, my experience. But I've been all over the world, so I've seen, I've seen universities where four students share a space this big. All right? I've seen that. And it's very difficult to teach in a university where four students have a space this big. Well, here's the problem. In this university, you have scientists and you have design professionals. It's fairly typical. The, science, the sciences are based on the premise that you learn something that is true anywhere. It's a science. But when you enter public policy, when you, when you say, what do I do with my science? You typically are supply-based, meaning you, you study the existing and past because you rely on data. It's a characteristic of the sciences. They're data-driven. And because of that focus on the existing, because of the focus on the existing, the public policies tend to be defensive. The idea of sustainability. Sustainability of what? Sustainability of now. Okay? And if you ask a group of scientists from different sciences, they will have different opinions and different priorities on what sustainability means. One will say protect the birds, one will say protect the water. Equally, can't, aren't impossible. Which, where do we do this? And as their work goes in this direction, it gets less and less and worse and worse. So the hydrologist that works on river basins can't necessarily tell you how to drain your house. Okay? Because we teach globally, but we don't practice locally. Design professions have the exact opposite. When you start in architecture, in landscape architecture, you start on a small project and you get bigger and bigger and bigger. You're demand based. You have a client who says, I need a shopping center, and you're going to design a shopping center. And you're offensive based. You want to change things less than protect them. You don't get published in the design profession until they're changing things. And not only that, changing things new. And you start here, and if you have five architects, or five landscape architects, or five lawyers, or five bankers, they won't agree. That's a zero-sum game. That's a competition. And they do less and less and less and worse and worse as they go here. And they do absolutely nothing globally. They think they can do it globally, but they don't do it globally. And the problem is that the global treaties don't come down to the local people. And the local changes don't go up to the global. And the real decisions are made here. And the real decisions where people know what's going on and vote and pay for it is in here, where the designers do the least and the scientists do the least. And they do the worst. Because they think they can do this, and they think they can do this, but they can't. And they don't. And it's here that these people have to work together. And not only that, they have to pay a lot of attention to the politics of the people of the place. Here you have a client. Here you don't have a client. You have 20 clients, and they fight. It's a very, very different situation. And I'm interested in this problem. I'm not interested in that, and I'm not, interested, I'm not capable of that, and I've done this. I don't need to do that. I think this is the problem. <clears throat> and that's a problem that the universities aren't dealing with. They're not dealing with it across departments. 
and not getting those people and those people together with those people and those people. That's important. Now, negotiation is pervasive. And um, the reason I'm focusing on negotiation, because I think negotiation is a design method. Right? It's not my inspiration, it's my ability to negotiate that makes me a designer. If you look at the ideas, the ideas that underlay things, actually, let me say something else. I, let me go back. At this scale, the tools, the tools that are very, very useful are GIS, typically, information technologies, and, and what, what the product is, is allocation. The public policies are basically, how much do we have and what do we do with it? Where do we put it? And the interests are longer term management. The interests here are the long term management of the globe. At that scale, the technologies that are coming up very fast are BIM, building information technologies. They're now required in England, uh, Switzerland, and Germany. No, no major building or, or even landscape can be submitted for public, public permission to build unless it's in BIM format. And, and the schools are very quickly moving to BIM as a technology to teach their architecture and planning students. The last conference of digital landscape architecture had BIM proposals. Here, we spend uh, much too much time on visualization. We spend much too much time. And we're interested in short-term management. How do I manage the process of building my building or designing and building my park? Here, the really, the really important things are how do we organize space, territorial and project-based space, and the strategic design, because the strategic design will tell these people what to do as projects. So I, I, I'm really interested much more in the beginnings of the design, not the end of the design. The end will be many, many projects. But how do you begin is the real problem. Okay, so the ideas, the ideas of negotiation. This is the diagram from the Brundtland Report, the 1987 United Nations. Sustainability is a relationship between environment, society, and economy. Fine. Equally? Surely not. Surely in some societies this is a bigger Scientists have to negotiate an idea. This is Vitruvius. Verbitas, utilitas, I can't read that, but it's basically, Vitruvius said, a building must be durable, useful, and beautiful. Equally? Surely not. Surely not. And here in the middle, one of my teachers said, there are three things that are important. Quantity, quality, and cost. And, and. Anytime you see three things, realize that you can only control two of them. So, you can have low cost, high qual and high quality, but then you can't have much. You can have much of high quality and you can't control the cost. So this is very important. So negotiation is one in which you have three things, but you can only control two. And one will float. It has to. And now, and now you have not only negotiation inside the scientists and negotiation inside the designers, but we need to find a way that they can collaborate with the people of the place at the scale of this. And that's itself a negotiation. And if we succeed, if we succeed in this, we then have to send to the projects and send to the global management. I mean, in, 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 in 30 years, our, uh, Argentina will have national management by digital means of the landscape. It has to. You know that those things are happening in the world. And, and so somebody makes a big change, it'll show up on a national database. 
it'll show up in a series of projects. And the management of that landscape at the global scale and at the project scale will be done with digital models. It will be, because it's already being done with digital models. And different societies will come 20 years later, and some will be ahead of the game, the Swiss will be ahead, the Germans will be ahead, the Ethiopians will be 30 years behind. But they can jump technology very quickly. And there's already a group in Ethiopia trying to do this. So. Now, collaborative negotiation requires communication. And Norbert Wiener, who was a great teacher at MIT, he wrote a book in 1948 called Cybernetics. And he basically, he basically developed theories, theories of communication. Two of them are important. One, in order for me to communicate with you, we have to have three things. A shared knowledge of the subject, shared assumptions, and a shared language. I'm very interested in the shared language. In, in my school, if you ask a student to make a plan of a, of a design, each student can pick their own colors for whatever they want. What color, what color is housing on the plan? What color is water on the plan? What color is a peanut tree on a plan? Every student picks their own color. Why? That means you, you need a legend for every map, and every map is different. But if, if I say no, this is the color, this is the color, and this is the color, I can read everybody's plan. So in my studio, it's not a democracy. I set the colors. You do the drawings. And we can read each other's work. It's very, very simple. I know of no school that does that. I did it for, for years. Right? We do this in the software. Damien has worked with us now twice with, with computer software. Everybody uses the same colors. We, when you make a presentation in the software, it's only two minutes because everybody can see the map. We don't have to explain. This is this and this is this. We see it immediately. The other thing is this. You have a group of people. They are the senders of the message. There's a message. It has an expression. It goes through a medium. This could be a drawing. It could be a poem. It could be music. It could be a picture. It could be anything. These people are the receivers. They have an impression of that expression. If they don't understand the impression from the expression by a shared language, they don't understand. Now the problem is, this is the designer, this is the information technology, this is the scientists. Inside the group, they have to also become receivers to them, and then they have to design in a way that sends through a medium back, and these people become the receivers. And if they don't have a shared language, if they don't understand each other's work, there's no way that change will happen. So this idea of what actually is the language that we use is extremely important. And, and unfortunately, in my university, people are very proud of inventing words and using jargon. And they write in something which we call archibabel. All right? And archibabel is just babel. Nobody understands it except a small group of people. And it's stupid. It's just stupid. Okay? So it doesn't work. Let's see. It just doesn't work. Now, after many years, many of my students have said, I have to write a book. So I wrote a book. And the book is color-coded. Anytime you see purple, it's the people, the design professions, the sciences, and the information technologists. And, and the, book, the book is about organizing, organizing geodesign studies at that, middle, at that middle range. It's not about the world, although it could be, and, and the smallest project could be done this way, but it's not terribly important. 
it's based upon it's based upon six questions six questions which every project of design whether it's scientifically oriented or architecturally oriented it doesn't matter it has to answer six questions every project must answer six questions how do we describe the context where are we what what are we seeing how does it work how does it work in terms of things that are important is it working well? The first is data, the second is knowledge, the third is values. Is it working well? It depends. For whom is it working well? Where is it working well? And then, how might it be changed? What difference does the change, do the changes cause? And how should it be changed? Those are the six questions. And the language, the language of these must be the same. The language of these must be the same. And the language of these must be the same. I'll give an example. To make a, a drawing of a design, I need an equal drawing of the existing conditions. Repton. Remember Repton. Otherwise, I don't know what you did. In other words, that's the existing conditions. That's my design. If I only show you this, you think I've designed five fingers. But I've only designed this one. It takes two drawings to show what I did. Not one. There are three phases. We have to decide why are we here and what are we trying to do. We're in Argentina. We're studying hydrology in Boca. It's not doing very well because it's poison. We have to clean the hydrology in Boca. Uh, we need to establish whether it's gotten better. We need to decide whether we should do it. Very simple. Then the question of how are we going to do it? And here we have to start here. What's important? How do we know we have a good design? How are we going to compare designs? How are we going to make designs? What are we going to change? What do we need to understand and what information do we need? And we need the least information, not the most information. And finally, let's do the study. Let's organize the data, the process models, let's evaluate the site, let's propose changes. Let's compare them. Let's decide whether they're not good enough, whether maybe we have to change scale, and whether they're good enough to present. And, and the book is in Spanish, and Damien has copies. And the thing about it is, when you work with a group of people, with a group of people who don't agree, and who have some designers, some information people, and some scientists, you never know where the ideas come from. When it's a group, a collaborative activity, anybody can propose an idea at any given time that may be the right idea. You never know who does it. And it's not my design, it's our design, which is a huge difference for students and for professionals. A huge difference. Very difficult. Very difficult. But you never know where the idea comes from. And it's never linear. It's simply never linear. Uh, it's a messy process. Design is a messy process. Even though it can be structured, it's not linear. Now, it has a workflow. It does have a workflow. A group of people, each of whom has to decide among 10 systems which is the most important and which is the least important. And a group of people who have to organize information process models, and evaluation maps. And they have to propose for their system diagrams of policies and projects. And there's a history. Every place, this is now, every place has a history. And not only that, it has a history of designs. And the people who made those designs were not stupid. And many of the things that they proposed 50 years ago still are the case. And then there are constants, things that are going to happen. And then there are many ways to make a design. Many diagrams come from each system. And the problem is, how do you come to a future? What are the projects and their timelines, their costs? And we have six or so designs. How do we get one? How do we test the impacts? Do we change scales? And eventually, we bring it to these people back for decision. Now, I gave a lecture five years ago, 
2012, almost six, almost six years ago. And at, 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 in London, at the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis, where I'm, we live in London and I'm an honorary professor there. And Rishi Balal, who came to me afterwards, and he said, I think that I can do what you've just shown completely digitally, completely in a computer system. I looked at him and I said, I also think that it can be completely in a computer system. Because I did my first computer plan, the very first computer-based plan, in 1965. Long time ago. And I've been working digitally. And anybody who works with me works partially digitally for the last 50, more than 50 years, a lot more than 50 years. So I met with him, and I and I said, there must be a list of 50 things that you need to do when, when you make a big design. There must be a list of about 50 things. And we started to make a list. Now Rishi. Rishi is an engineer. He's a mechanical engineer who went to Michigan and to the MIT. But he grew up in Japan. And he went to work for Honda. And everything that Honda does is done collaboratively, including designing screws. Everything is done collaboratively. And so he was really interested in, in building software, computer software, for collaborative design. And so we met, and we made a list of 50 things. And he finished his PhD in a year and a half with a working system. And it's a system that has nothing in it. Everything that's in it is put in by either these people or those people. And it can be used in conjunction with almost any computer system of any kind that does any task in the world. Now, you've used it now twice or three times, including here with your students. Okay, so the most important aspect of this is these people need to agree and there are tools in it that help negotiation. That's, the, that's a unique contribution of this software. Now, there are, three ways, there are three ways in which a design for a large design is usually made. The first one is by commission. These people, this could be this could be the city council of Buenos Aires. It needs to put another million people in Buenos Aires. It does. In the next ten years another million people will come to work Buenos Aires. So it says it says to Damien, Damien and Company. Damien and Company, we want you, that's your team. You have 30 people in your office, lawyers, bankers, architects, planners, engineers, etc. And we want you to make a design for a million people near the airport. That's not an uncommon thing. And what you're going to do is say, oh yes, please agree on what's important, which they can't do. And you're going to make a series of designs and you're presenting them and you're presenting them. And at some times, the most important thing will be the visualization when you present it to the client. This is the, the way most of us teach and the way most of us practice. And it has one big problem. How do you know that your company wouldn't have done a better plan than his company? That's a very big problem. Because in the end, you have to take his design or throw it away. You can't take half of his design. You have to take it all or none. Usually none. The other, another approach would be competition. Same client. We have six teams. Each makes a design in its own way. Then there's a first presentation, and these people say, let's no, yes, yes, no, yes, no. And it ends this way. It ends by them saying, I'm going to pick that design. 
But that's a zero-sum game. That's a classic zero-sum game because there may be things in these designs, or even these designs, which are better than the aspect of this design. And there's no, no way of structuring that. Structuring. The third one is by collaborative negotiation. We're going to make one design, not for all of them, but a separate design for each group of them. We're going to make a red design. We're going to make a yellow design. We're going to make an orange design, a purple design, and a blue design. Separately. And at some point, we're going to say, take the things after a presentation that are better from other designs. And then we're going to ask each of the groups how similar they are and how much they can work together. And then we're going to negotiate in a hierarchy to get one design. In other words, the designers negotiate. And in fact, the entire group of people does the negotiation. So that the client is part of the process of negotiation. And everybody gets the politics play a role, no question about it. But one design comes out. And nobody wins everything, but nobody loses everything. Now, we've done more than 100 projects in the last two and a half years around the world. And each of these projects has been in one or two days. One or two days. We get all the people together, we lock them up for one or two days. Other people have used the software over months. We've had several people using it for graduate studios. A lot, there are several, many universities, not many, maybe a dozen, that have used it as the structure of their graduate studio. Okay. But the projects that Tess and I and Rishi have run are one or two days. He was in one, a one-day workshop on Papula a week ago, in one day. Now, why, why do it fast? Why do it fast? Keep in mind, this is aimed at the beginning stages of design, not the details. When working through a framework in order to understand it, when applying geodesign, and there's little time and small data. At the conference that we were in Belo Horizonte last week, we had two graduate students from Norcia in Italy. They went there and they worked with the people of this village that had been destroyed on what should be done immediately. They didn't have much time. But they did that study, and it was part of their master's thesis. When starting fast in order to identify central issues and options, simply getting everybody together to talk quickly focuses you on what's important. Instead of having to meet with the Minister of Transport, the Minister of Interior, the Minister of Agriculture, the Minister of this, the Minister, bring them together, have one meeting, and they'll figure out pretty quickly what's important. If you can get them to when starting fast. When it takes a design to know what the questions really are, that's very common. That people in the abstract have no idea what the future might be like. And it takes a design to get them to say, ah, not that. I don't want that. I want something more like this. Or when it takes a design to know what's really wanted. The client doesn't know what they want. On a house, yes. On a city, no. So you can't do a house like you do a city. It has to be different. And now I want a glass of water, and I'm going to show you two projects. So just take, let's, do we have a time limit? No time limit. Five minutes. Five minute break. Open the door, open the window. <laughs> Same basic computer software, but they're totally different in content, geography, scope. The, this project 
is the very beginning stage of a very difficult policy question. This is Sydney, Australia. Sydney, Australia, urbanistically, is about 150 years old. And this area is the oldest suburban area in the city. In the city, it's 100% built. It's 100% built. Mainly low buildings. It has the, the port. Captain Cook came into Botany Bay. This is Botany Bay when it was settled by who knows what it was. It has the port. It has the airport. It has the biggest university, the University of New South Wales, and the biggest hospital. The downtown is right here. The opera house, the bridge, the center. The airport is supposed to move. The port is moving. The city is doubling. And the question is, should they double the density of the oldest suburb that's 100%? It's like when this area is 20 years ago. Low, all of a sudden, should it go up? It has very poor, very poor blue infrastructure. In fact, the famous beaches, the famous Australian beaches, are right here. One, two, three. And they're more polluted than they announce. <coughs> okay? Everybody thinks the Australians have clean urban beaches. Not true. And it has the most famous golf course, but it has an old park system and no connections, no green infrastructure. So in this area, the city is going to grow from 4.7 to about 8 million by 2050. And they don't want to grow outward because they have mountains behind them. So the question is, can they grow upward? So the projected changes is 180,000 new homes and an additional 360,000 people in an existing 100% built environment. If you convert that into floor area, this is the study area, and this is the floor area of physical change that is proposed if this idea moves forward in terms of policy. Now, it usually takes about a month to organize the technology of doing a project but it takes several months to get a group of people to be able to meet for two days in one place. So those of you in the front, Sydney Water, Arab, the business consultant, the city council, there were three, three uh, uh, political zones. Each has councils, they're represented. The Land and Housing Company, the Greater Sydney Commission, the Urban Growth New South Wales, Transport New South Wales, the Department of Planning and Environment, the Department of Planning, the Education Department, the University, and then a group of people from the University that are the core team. So what this is a study with the people who are responsible for making the plans for Sydney are meeting in one place at one time for two days. Instead of in each office, they're in one place for two days with nothing else on their agenda. In the upper right is Chris Pettit. Chris Pettit is a, a member of the Landscape and Environment faculty at New South Wales, but he's a geographer. He's professionally a geographer. And this is the group of people. These are, these are not students. These are serious, experienced professionals. This, this is Rishi, and what we're doing at 10 o'clock in the morning on day one, this, there's always a time here, 
10 o'clock in the morning. We're teaching them the software that was prepared over the previous month by Chris and his graduate students. And we teach them the beginning of the software in about 15 minutes. And what their role in the beginning is, is to make diagrams of policies and projects in the systems in which they know that we then have to combine into a proposal. In other words, we're not talking at the beginning and we're not sketching at the beginning. Your role is history and culture. And I want you to make 10 diagrams of policies and projects that protect the history and culture of this place. Yours is transportation. I want to know 10 diagrams of policies and projects where you can improve pedestrian transportation in this area. We're going to give you evaluation models of where action is a good idea. If it's red, it means this is working very well, leave it alone. If it's yellow, it means it's inappropriate. The darker green is where the projects are the most needed and most wanted. In green infrastructure, blue infrastructure, tourism, education, commerce and industry, high density housing, middle density housing, vehicular transportation, and pedestrian and bicycle transportation. That's done beforehand by the experts who know these areas. It could be done by the people of the place. This is a diagram. It says, I'm going to draw this to 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 this. It's a new sewage treatment plant. It has a size, it has a cost, and it has a timeline. A diagram can be imported from GIS. It does not have to be drawn by hand. Those are diagrams. If it's hatched, it's a policy, that's a project. That's the color for commerce and industry. These colors are either invented or the official colors of the city. Each of these has a cost, a name, and by pressing this square, I can put it into a design. Pressing it again, I remove it from the design. And at the end of the first day, at the first morning, we had about 120, 130 diagrams. Because these people knew what they were doing. Now it's the afternoon, it's 1 o'clock after lunch. And we're showing them in six groups how to make a design. And the six groups are environmental sustainability and resilience, new housing development, the hospital and the university employment, efficient public service, tourism and recreation, and they want this idea of compactness. They don't want the, if they're going to build tall, they don't want it to be all over. They want it to be in groups. And it relates to transit. So each group at around 1.30 in the afternoon has to say, for our interest, which projects and policies help our interest? And they have everybody, everybody's ideas are public ideas. There are no private ideas. Every computer has every diagram. So my team wants this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, but not this one, this one. And when you press it, it goes into the design. And that's a design. That's a design. <coughs> and that design has two characteristics. It has impacts. Purple means it's a good location. Orange means it's a bad location. And it has time. So this, this says which comes, each project or policy has a time frame that you can change. And so you can grow the place and you can, you can look at how it grows. And now it's 2.30 on day one. This is the timeline. This is, this is each project that you've picked when it happens. And this is the budget that 
comes with it. And one button and it's in 3D. That's in the middle of the first game. And at 3 o'clock, they're making their second version, their second design, including changing the cost budget because they're spending too much money in year 5 or 10, and changing the design by removing diagrams or editing diagrams or adding diagrams. And at the end of the first day, we've saved the first design. These are the first designs. And each group, <coughs> each group has a different set of priorities for the 10 systems. They don't agree. And they've each made their own design. And that's the second design. I'll go back. This is the first design. And that's the second design. And that's at the end of the first day. So now we're at day two, at 9 o'clock in the morning. And now we tell the teams, you can see each other's designs. If they've done something better than you, take their diagrams. You know which diagrams are in their design because the computer will tell you what diagrams are in their design. You think it's better than yours, take it. And so they're, they're, they're now negotiating. This, this woman here is asking this man here, we want to use your road system, but we want to change it a little bit. Can we change it a little bit and agree? And they'll say yes, so they come together. The aim at the end is to agree. So if, if we can make a partnership, why not? And that's the third design. And now it's 10 o'clock in the morning. That's version three. By the way, this is the, de the decision model, the design, the areas in each of the program, the impacts. That's bad. That's good. And the cost. The cost is down there. The problem is that depending upon which measure, the best design varies. This may be the best decision model, the best physical design, meets the program the most, the best impacts, and the lowest cost. And you still have to pick one, decide what to do. So you can't pick one best design because of the size. There's no way to pick one best design simply because the project is so big. It's not possible. Because depending upon what the criteria for picking is, Different designs might be best. So we have to negotiate. Well, here are some ways to negotiate. The first one is, let's put all the diagrams on top of each other. Every diagram of a policy or project that was selected by any design, put it on top. If the color looks like the color code, it means there's agreement. There's agreement here, agreement here, agreement here, disagreement here, disagreement here, because the colors are muddy. They don't look like the color code. So we can know where we agree a little bit. We know where we disagree. So you can say, well, that's, we know agreement. That's actually important. But knowing disagreement is also important. The other thing we can do we can count the number of times each diagram was used. Those of you who are in the front, you see there's a number five there. That means five of the six teams used that diagram. So we can say, give me all the, make a design, all the six where everybody agrees, all the fives, all the fours. It's like voting for policies and plans. And it's a very good technique. Students would find that terrible. But it really is important. If, if all six teams agree, maybe it's a good idea. But the best technique is this. We gave each team, each team, three minutes to describe what was important. 
only three minutes. I never let people talk forever. <laughs> but we can read each other's diagrams. We can eat, read each other's drawings because we have the same color code. So we know exactly what's going on because we've made the designs. In three minutes, it's easy to describe a design that's complicated. And then we used a sociogram. A sociogram was invented in 1934 by elementary school teachers to decide who sits next to whom in the, in the young children's school. Do you sit next to your friends or away from your friends? So they ask each child, who are your friends? And then they can analyze the pattern and let people sit next to in the optimum strategic way next to your friends. Or away if that's what the teacher wants. So what we do after the presentation is each team has to say, can they be a partner for each other team? Likely partner, not likely partner, or never a partner. And by, and by having each team review each other team, we can organize, I like your work, you like my work, let's just make a plan together. Right? I don't like you and you don't like me, we're never going to work together, except at the very end. And you can analyze, you can analyze this very easily. By the way, it's a terrific teaching mechanism because your students are not prepared to talk to other students and, and, and evaluate their work usually. But if you're the, the head of an office, you have to do that all the time. So why not do it in school? Anyway, so there's a structure then of the negotiation that comes directly from, from this analysis. And we have a tool that says, we can take any two designs and put them, take them apart. These are two designs. These are the diagrams in the two designs. The design can be divided by its use. This is the housing. These are the two housing patterns of these designs. So this group can say, I don't want this is different than this is different. Yes or no, yes or no, and many of these are the same. And it focuses the negotiation. And this is a line. So if I press this, it'll appear in that. If I press this, it'll disappear. So this is live. And so this negotiation says, yes, number four, number four, and number four appears. And it's a tool. It's a tool for focusing negotiation, not in the abstract but precisely on projects that are being proposed. And so here's the negotiation. This is 3.30 on day two. This is the final two teams. They presented in three minutes. That's where they agreed already. They already had the same diagrams there. And now they're negotiating. One speaks. They're comparing the designs. They're comparing the blue and green infrastructure of what's important. It goes into the design. They're doing the commerce. It goes into the design. And that's the final design. The final design has green, blue infrastructure, new housing, a linear transportation system. Impacts are not great in the left on the west, but they're much better in the center. And this, if I can do this, this is the staging. This is the staging of the design with its projects and its budget and its impacts linked. And that's at about 5 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the afternoon of the second day. I'm going to stop that. But and it's in various 3Ds and it's in City Engine. And that's the priority green infrastructure scheme for this area. It's two days with 350,000 new people. And now it's a question of is this a good idea or not? And that's their problem to decide. This is the largest project we've ever done. This is 40,000 square kilometers. 
40,000 square kilometers. It's the size of the Netherlands. And the, the interesting thing about it is that there are 10 counties, it's the state of Georgia, the coastal zone of the state of Georgia. There are 10 counties which have the political responsibility for making the plans. And a regional agency that has the political responsibility for coordinating the plans. And so these counties function independently. They have to negotiate and they have to come together. This is going to be quick. We did a study of Savannah, Georgia, which had to double. And it had to double when, by 2050, the United States Oceanographic a Agency says you're going to lose half the land in the, in the county because of low-lying flooding. So how do you double the population and lose half the land? And we made a plan. That, that's, that was, we, we were able to, to show how that would work. So they asked us to come back. And that's the coastal zone of Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia is in the middle of the state. And this is the landscape of the county. Lots of wetlands, low-lying wetlands. Now, this is an area that is going to be very heavily impacted by sea rise. And by additional hurricanes. Because the hurricanes are moving north from Florida up the coast. And they want to double the population, double the port, and have a new spaceport. Because the Kennedy, the Kennedy uh, spaceport in Florida is underwater. It's going to be underwater. Um, we have a national system now in America for green infrastructure. It's, on, it's an ESRI product, and it's a national database which can be used locally for identifying green infrastructure. It, it covers the entire country. And I'm just going to show you a bunch of components. The natural areas that are big, wetness, the variety of the soil characteristics, the forested land, the wetlands in natural areas, the, the absence of human modification. And put together, this is the product of priority for conservation. However, it doesn't include, it does not include groundwater or existing conserved areas. Many of the most important areas are already in conservation. So this is, this is the priority. And this is, look, just, this is the problem. The problem is the priority and the existing areas will be underwater. So if you were designing a green infrastructure for this area for the year 2050, what would you do? Would you go for the most important ones now? Or the most important ones after a sea rise? In the way future when the people now who pay for it don't necessarily use it. It's a very, very complicated problem. Now, Ryan Purple at the University of Arizona has worked on this problem of connectivity, and he wants to connect in the optimum way the existing areas. So the same system, history and culture, forestry, agriculture, utilities, transport, housing, housing, commerce, and industry. Each has its analysis. We got people of all the, lots of people together, and we got people from every county We made them make diagrams. They're making the diagrams of policies and projects. And now we created a team for each county. In other words, 
Each county has its own team making a design only for its county. And there they are. These are 12 different designs, each for its own county. Then we're going to present them. Then we're going to start counties talking to counties, which they don't do politically. So for example, so two roads don't go this, the roads go like this. And those are the plans for each county. And now that's all the plans together. That's them together. But what's important is now they're going to start negotiating. So, this is the negotiation between two of the regional schemes where they're going side by side and arguing about different aspects. And now each of the designs of a county is going to be discussed. So she is the director of the regional agency. And she's going to meet with each of these teams and say yes or no to the components of their designs. And as she says yes or no to the pieces of their designs, those pieces are going to start to appear in the regional design. Because all it takes is one button to put it into the design or out of the design. So this is the consensus. 